So today's uh, main topic uh, is about heart health. So every day we hear about conflicting studies and miracle foods and tablets, especially via WhatsApp. But it's always important to treat each piece of uh, advice with caution. So today's speaker, however, can wholeheartedly be trusted to give the best available advice, which is based on extensive research and evidence. Our main speaker today is Dr. Navdej Singh Chahal. He's a consultant cardiologist at the London Northwest uh, Health NHS Trust. He's an honorary senior clinical lecturer at Imperial College London. And he is the first UK cardiologist to be certified by the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. He's, he has a strong academic interest in matters such as preventative cardiology and also in lifestyle medicine for treating and preventing heart disease. And his PhD explored the increased risk of cardiovascular disease amongst Indian, Asian and European white individuals. Uh, and he has written many, many papers on, on these topics. So please, please welcome Dr. Navdej Singh Chahal. Thank you very much. Um, I'm extremely honoured um, to be asked to speak here today. And um, when uh, Uncle asked me to speak, I had no hesitation in accepting the offer. Um, so we will be talking about prevention, but to start off with, I'm going to talk a bit about what can go wrong with the heart. I've got my little assistant here who's going to be doing the, the slides for me. Thank you, Sahana. Um, so next slide, please. So these are some of the questions that I've kind of imagined many people will have on their minds. And these are frequently the questions that I get asked either formally during consultations or informally in many social situations. And it will be around topics such as blood pressure, should I take a statin, um, what are the symptoms of a heart attack, does being Asian make me at high risk of having heart disease? I'm sure you'll have many other better questions on your mind and I'm happy to ask them. At the, I'll answer them at the end of the talk. So, just a brief overview of the heart. So, that's an MRI scan of a heart beating away in uh, real time inside the chest. So, this is a slice through the chest. You've got, um, if you can imagine, your feet would be coming out towards the auditorium and your head would be going through the screen. Uh, and you've got four chambers there. Um, you've got the main pumping chamber here, which is called the left ventricle. And this is really what it's all about, trying to preserve that chamber because that's the motor of the heart the main pumping chamber that pumps around five to six liters of blood around the body every minute even when you're just sitting there doing nothing and that can go up three or four times that amount when you're exercising so anything that will affect that muscle will lead to problems and on the right hand side of the screen you've got a ct scan of the arteries the coronary arteries there's three main coronary arteries and that supplies that muscle and that supplies on the outside of the heart the blood and delivers oxygen to the muscle. So obviously, if you can preserve the arteries, then that gives you a better chance of avoiding any heart problems. But what, can, what else can go wrong with the heart? So we talked, I break it down into three groups. The plumbing, so with the arteries, we've kind of mentioned that already. The muscle, that's the muscle of the, the left side of the heart, and also the electrical wiring. So things can go wrong independently of each one of those things without affecting the other but they can also be interrelated. So on the left-hand side, that's an angiogram. So many people will be aware of angiograms. Normally, they have been done traditionally invasively. We put tubes into groins or into wrist arteries and inj inject dye up into the heart, and we get a nice clear anatomy of the heart arteries. But increasingly, we're using CT scans to get that same information. So in this patient, has got a very tight narrowing of the artery there. I hope you can see that with the yellow arrow. And that can cause symptoms of chest pain, angina, or obviously heart attack. And in the middle, again, it's another scan of the heart, but this time, this time it's not pumping very well and it's become very dilated. Um, I'm not sure if that will play, play well, but it's not pumping as well as it should do. And that will cause symptoms as well. And on the right-hand side, we've got a patient with a very abnormal heart rhythm. Now, there are things that can cause problems with the arteries, problems with the heart muscle, and problems with the rhythm directly. So, 
having a high cholesterol, having high blood pressure, if you're a smoker, if you're diabetic, that can cause coronary artery disease narrowing and that will cause you symptoms of chest pain or worse. If you have high blood pressure, if you're diabetic, certain viruses, even the flu virus or a common cold, or you've got a genetic disorder, that can cause weakness of the heart muscle directly. And if you've got high blood pressure, drink too much alcohol. And again, if you've got a genetic disorder, that can cause an electrical abnormality, and that can cause sudden death. But of course, each one of these conditions can affect the other. So if you've got a blocked artery, then that can cause heart failure. That can cause electrical abnormality. Likewise, having heart failure can cause electrical abnormalities. Electrical abnormalities can cause heart failure. So there's some interrelation. But one thing that's common, hopefully, that you can see is things like having high blood pressure, diabetes, um, drinking too much alcohol. They seem to be common things through all the three different types of conditions. So controlling those will hopefully reduce significantly your risk of getting any one of these three main types of heart disease. So we're just going to talk about coronary artery disease for the time being because that's obviously the most common and the most common, still the most common cause of death um, in the UK and the Western world. So typically what happens is cholesterol builds up in the artery and it causes narrowing over time. If that happens, um, as I said, over a period of time, you can get angina where you get, narrow, uh, you get tightness in the chest, especially when you're exerting yourself. But if you're unlucky, suddenly that artery can block off because the blood sticks to that narrowed bit of cholesterol and that will cause a sudden heart attack. So what are, what are the signs or the symptoms of a heart attack? Well, it can be very difficult sometimes, but the classic signs or symptoms are that constricting chest pain that you get, especially at rest when you're not actually doing anything. And the key thing to pay attention to is how suddenly it happens. If it's been going on for months and months and months, then it's unlikely to be a heart attack. But if suddenly you feel unwell over a period of just a few seconds or minutes, and particularly if you've got heaviness in the front of your chest, your neck, your jaw, or even the front of the shoulder, the top of the stomach, sometimes in the middle between the shoulder blades, these can be signs of a heart attack and you shouldn't ignore it and you should call 999. Now, there are some less typical symptoms which you can be forgiven for overlooking. And even as doctors, sometimes we may not appreciate that this could be the sign of a heart attack. So, and they tend to be more common in women, unfortunately. So women in particular, we can overlook the fact that they may be having a heart attack. So again, they may suddenly feel lightheaded, get a heartburn sensation. They may feel very tired suddenly. And also, they may um, feel nauseous or start uh, vomiting. Again, pay attention to the suddenness of the symptoms. If this has been going on for months, if you've been feeling tired for years, then you know, it's unlikely you're having a heart attack. But if you're actually normally a very active person and one day you just feel very unwell in a non-specific way, then that's something that needs to be uh, attended to. So in terms of diagnosing a heart attack, you need to have two things. You need to have, obviously, this can only be done in hospital and I wouldn't recommend going to a GP surgery because many of them don't have the facility even to do an ECG, although that is getting better nowadays. And they certainly won't have the facility to do the specialised blood test immediately that we can do in the hospital. So that's the troponin blood test, which is very sensitive and can pick up even very small heart attacks nowadays. And with the combination of an ECG gives us a very good idea whether or not individual uh, patients are having a heart attack. And in terms of treating heart attacks, nowadays we used to use powerful clot-busting drugs that dissolve the clot, but they cause complications and bleeding elsewhere. So now we are using directly angioplasty techniques where an angiogram is done, a, the narrowed artery is found, we pass a wire through the artery, the blockage, inflate a balloon, on the balloon is mounted a stent and that springs open. The balloon is deflated and removed, the stent stays in place, and hopefully, as you can see in this patient who started off with a blocked artery, the flow is restored down the artery. And that, show, that has been proven to reduce death and any serious complications. So most hospitals in the UK, I think, um, there is a very well-established what we call angioplasty network now. So especially in London, 
the main hospitals that do this are Hammersmith, um, Harefield, um, in, in this part of, uh, in West London. And the ambulances should automatically take you to those centres if they think that you're having a heart attack. Angina is a kind of milder form of coronary artery disease. And that's when, as I showed before, the artery is not completely blocked, but it's partially narrowed. And you'll get those symptoms of chest heaviness and tightness when you're doing something exertional. So when you're going up the stairs, when you're walking fast, and you get that tightness across the chest, that can be very suspicious for angina. And the way we diagnose that, well, diagnosing it is a little bit more tricky, actually, than a heart attack, because we don't use the blood test, we don't use ECG. We use scans for this now. So we use CT scans, so I've already showed you a picture of that. So that takes high-resolution x-rays through the chest, and we inject a dye into the vein, and usually we get very high-quality pictures of the coronary arteries. And the other technique that we use a lot of is stress echo. So this is very different. We take ultrasound pictures of the heart. We exercise the patient on a treadmill, or sometimes we give a drug if they can't do that. And then we take pictures of the heart muscle moving in real time, and that can show whether the heart muscle is pumping as well as it should do. Sorry, this is not playing very well. But we'll see the heart muscle almost cramping up, and that tells us that there's not a good blood supply. So sometimes we do... Uh, one test and is enough. Sometimes we need to do both tests to get the answer. Sometimes we use a stress echo first. Sometimes you do the angio first. So it doesn't really matter too much which test you're getting as long as the center that's doing it is very expert in doing these tests and analyzing the results. So we've had a whistle-stop tour of what can go wrong with the heart. Now, obviously, you don't want to get to that stage if you can help it, especially heart failure. You want to avoid that really at all costs because... There's very little you can do in terms of treatment at reversing that process. So the majority um, from now my talk will be focused on preventing heart disease. Now, if you look at this slide, uh, we've divided it into what we call the risk factors. Now, there are non-modifiable risk factors. And as the name suggests, they're things that you can't do anything about. So that if you're, as you get older, your heart risk of heart disease increases. If you're male, you have a higher risk of heart disease. There are some genetic factors which we haven't really fully mapped out yet. And there are no kind of tests that you can do, genetic tests, to say really whether you're going to have a very high risk of having a heart attack or not. So we're not quite there yet. And of course, there's ethnicity as well. So we know that Asians have at least a 50% higher risk of dying from cardiovascular disease, um, sometimes even like a twofold risk higher. So on the right-hand side, though, are the things we call the modifiable risk factors. So that is your diet, the blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, physical activity, obesity, and smoking. Now, 90% of heart attacks are due to the factors on the right-hand side of the screen. So if you, can, if you want to really modify your risk, then you have to pay attention to those things rather than worry really about the things on the left-hand side of the screen, which you can't really do much about. But if you do are identified as having a maybe a high risk in your family, then it's even more important that you pay attention to the things on the right-hand side of the screen. So people frequently ask me that my father had a heart attack. Am I at high risk of having a heart attack myself? It depends. So we look really closely at the family history. So if it is a first degree family member, like father, mother, or a brother or sister, who's had the misfortune of having a heart attack at a young age, then yes, then your risk will be increased. But if it's a cousin, grandparent, niece, or, or something like that, then no, that's not really that relevant. But if it is your father, and he's had his heart attack age 75, then no, that's not really a strong risk factor. That's probably more the aging process than any genetic kind of issues. But for, so if you're a male, first degree family member who's male, who's had a heart attack at less than age 55, then that's relevant. And if it's, for example, your mother and she's had a heart attack at the age of 50, then that's relevant as well. So slightly lower kind of age cutoffs for whether it was a female or male that was affected by the heart disease. 
just focusing a little bit more now on other risk factors that are relevant to women. So on the right-hand side is all the normal things that apply to both men and women. So we've discussed that already. So that's high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, obesity, and activity or inactivity. What is probably not often appreciated are things that obviously can only occur in women that can then lead to higher risk in later life. So in particular, having autoimmune conditions like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, they cause inflammation in the system. So they can increase the risk um, almost as much as being diabetic does. So three times the risk. During pregnancy, if you had high blood pressure or became diabetic during pregnancy, which is quite common, and then that reverses, it doesn't mean that your risk has gone back to zero. That does carry forward risk for you later on in life as well. So it's really important. If a woman does develop diabetes or blood pressure during pregnancy, then afterwards that they modify their lifestyle as much as they can and exercise and lower their blood pressure as much as they possibly can. Early menopause. So women are usually protected by estrogen. So menopause obviously shuts down the estrogen production. And that estrogen is very good for the arteries. So when you start running out of estrogen, then you can start getting a higher risk of heart attacks. So if you have an early menopause, that can increase your risk four and a half fold. And depression, which is more prevalent in women, can double the risk of ischemic heart disease. So stress. Now, a lot of people ask me, I have a lot of stress. Is that the reason why I had a heart attack? Not directly. So I know this is a little bit of a joke slide. Now, who actually is probably under the most stress here? Now, you might think it's the little dog underneath, let's say the, the rather large woman sitting above it. But I would say the woman probably has more stress. Because when you're stressed, what do you do? You probably don't exercise so much. You start eating badly. You drink more. You don't sleep so well. And they're the things that we've been discussing already will eventually lead to problems with the heart. So, no, it's not a case of being under intense stress. Stress, certain amount of stress is good. We all face stress in our jobs and in our lives. But it won't directly the next day cause a heart attack. But over a period of time, if you adopt certain kind of unhealthy behaviors in response to the stress, then you'll kind of end up in the same boat as someone else who doesn't exercise enough and drinks too much. Okay, next. So this is the question that probably I get asked the most. What is a high cholesterol? My cholesterol is X. Is that high? And should we all be taking a statin? And there's obviously been a lot of things in the newspapers about statins. Firstly, cholesterol, where does it come from? Well, actually, the majority of it is made in the liver. So it utilizes... Um, food sources, triglycerides in particular, repackages that and that converts it to cholesterol. So a lot of the cholesterol that we have, so if you have a high cholesterol, is probably because you've inherited a faulty gene that works in the liver and it produces too much cholesterol. But of course, a lot of it comes from, the rest of it comes from our diet as well, food sources, which we can do something about. So what is a normal cholesterol, if there is such a thing? Um, here's a traffic light system. So having a cholesterol less than 5.2, that's the total cholesterol value, is, is green, that's desirable. Between 5.2 to 6.2, that means it's, it's borderline. And above 6.2 is high. So I think many people get worried when their cholesterol is, you know, 5.5, but to me, that's probably not a big deal at all. Even going up to high five, going up to six, I think probably with diet you can control that and get that back down into the normal range. But if the cholesterol is above 6.2, it doesn't mean that we're going to rush in and start treating it with statins either. In terms of diet, you all know this. This is Cholesterol is basically found in anything that was alive and had a liver at some point. So obviously meat, animals. 
fish has a lot of cholesterol in it. Chicken has a lot of cholesterol in it. So if you're serious about reducing your cholesterol, you're going to have to cut down and you don't want to take tablets. And many people say that directly to me. I don't want to take a statin. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But then you're going to basically have to cut out all meat sources in your diet. And that probably includes dairy as well. Eggs have a lot of cholesterol in them. And obviously the oils that we use to cook our food, if they are saturated fats, um, animal-based oils will have a lot of cholesterol in them too. You've heard probably of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So good cholesterol or HDL cholesterol actually goes around and mops up the cholesterol from the circulation, from the artery. So that's obviously good. It removes it. Bad cholesterol or LDL cholesterol is does the opposite. So that actually takes the cholesterol from the liver and puts it into the arteries. And normally, if you do have a high cholesterol, you'll find it's probably due to the fact that you've got high LDL or bad cholesterol. It's very rare to find someone who's got a high cholesterol and it's due to having a high good cholesterol. So it's mainly due to LDL cholesterol. And that's what will cause the narrowing in your arteries ultimately. So if you had an experiment where you could run someone's cholesterol down to zero, they would probably die because they, we need cholesterol to make hormones and keep the cells intact. But actually, they will never have a heart attack. So you do need cholesterol, ultimately, to have a blockage in an artery. So the lower you can keep it, the better. But no one has a cholesterol that's you know less than three, usually. The lowest cholesterol that you'll see in the normal healthy people is about three to five. It doesn't go less than three. We do need cholesterol. And similarly, what is high blood pressure? And what are the symptoms of high blood pressure? You know, I'm having a headache. I check my blood pressure. It's high. I went to the hospital, blah, blah, blah. I spent five hours there, and they sent me home. Um, now, in terms of what is a high blood pressure, first, we have to measure it properly. And we measure it. Everyone's had this done, I'm sure. You can use um, the come to the clinic to have it measured by us manually using um, a um, pressure manometer cuff. And there's two numbers that you're going to be told. And it's important that you know these numbers because some people say they're told that my blood pressure was all right. And I say exactly what it was. They don't know. So you do need to know exactly what the blood pressure numbers are. So you've got the top number, the systolic, that's the bigger number, and that should be less than 120. And you've got the smaller number, the lower number, diastolic, that's when the heart relaxes, that should be less than 80. But it's very unusual to have one that's high and one that's normal. They tend to go together if it's a serious blood pressure or a genuine blood pressure problem. You can also measure blood pressure. Many people have these machines at home. And that gives us some useful information because when you come to the clinic to get your, your blood pressure measured by myself or your GP or even a nurse, some people find that quite stressful without actually even realizing it is. And their brain subconsciously will just lift up the blood pressure. And they can have blood pressure of 160, 170, 180 in the clinic. So trying to measure your blood pressure at home when you're more relaxed, and it's important you do it when you're relaxed rather than when you're tired, or anxious, or you have a headache, because all of those things will put up your blood pressure. So if you have a headache, that's pain. When you're in pain, your blood pressure goes up. If I bang my knee, my blood pressure will go up. So if I've got a headache, my blood pressure will go up. So it's not the blood pressure usually causing the headache, it's the other way around. So it's important if you're gonna do this at home to do it in nice, calm, relaxed circumstances at the same time of day. And sometimes that's, enough if you've got good quality readings you collect enough readings over two weeks for us to make a decision about whether you've got high blood pressure or not but even better than that and quite frequently this is what i will ask patients to have is a 24-hour blood pressure monitor so an ambulatory blood pressure monitor as it shows in the picture you wear a cuff it's connected to a machine that you wear on your belt and you walk around go to sleep with it on. And that gives us much more powerful information because what we're really interested in is the average blood pressure. 
So even during the daytime when you're wearing this, we may see your readings genuinely go up to 150, 160. But as long as it goes down when you're relaxed or at nighttime and it averages out to less than 120, then that's what we're really interested in. So having a high blood pressure during the daytime is not a problem. We do need to, to go up sometimes when we're rushing around, when we're you know, um, stressed or busy or whatever. But as long as it has the ability to go down, that's why sleep is so important. Because if you don't sleep well, it's not giving the blood pressure the chance to recover at nighttime. So that's the gold standard test for deciding whether someone's got high blood pressure or not. I've already touched on this. What are the symptoms of high blood pressure? Well, if you go into the internet, and as I did, this is what you'll find. You'll feel you, it can cause anxiety, brain damage, breathlessness, fear, hemorrhage. The list goes on, all very scary stuff. But the reality is, it's none of those things. So blood pressure is more of a silent killer. So this is the problem. So blood pressure will cause major problems, but over a period of 10, 15, 20 years, if it's not treated. It's very rarely an, a problem that I need to deal with in the next month or two. There are some isolated patients like that, and they tend to have uncontrollable blood pressure of 250 over 120 or something like that. And they're, they're, that's a different category altogether. But as you can see here, this is what blood pressure can do to you if it's not treated over a period of time. So obviously it can cause a heart attack by damaging the arteries, allowing cholesterol to build up there. It can cause heart failure, stroke, kidney dysfunction, and it can affect your eyesight as well. Just a little bit about heart failure. I've already shown a picture like this. So what is heart failure? That's when you get swelling, you put on weight, your ankles swell up, and you get very breathless. You can't lie flat very easily in bed because it feels like you're drowning because the fluid is actually building up on your chest. And high blood pressure causes thickening of that heart muscle of that ventricle chamber that I was talking about earlier. So it can't relax properly. And when it can't relax, the pressure builds up and that's what causes the symptoms. And this can be very difficult to treat once it's happened. So again, maintaining, knowing your blood pressure numbers are really important. So if your blood pressure is you know, 145 over 89 or something, and GP says it's okay. To me, that's probably not okay. It's something, the lower the better. You need to get your blood pressure down, especially women. Thank you very much. Next slide, thank you. <clears throat> so yes, preventing heart failure, getting the blood pressure down is really, really important. And when should we start taking treatment for a high cholesterol or a high blood pressure? So I've already touched on the fact that we kind of grade the cholesterol as being normal, mildly elevated or high. But that doesn't mean you need to start a statin tablet straight away. Likewise, blood pressure, there's no cutoff value where we just say, right, you need to start blood pressure treatment. What we do look at, though, is the bigger picture. So we want to look at so if you've just got a high blood pressure problem, then we want to know what your cholesterol is. We want to know whether you've had a heart problem before. We want to know what your age is, your gender. Sometimes we want to know about the kidney function. So this all kind of plays in to the decision about when to start tablets. And what we use are these risk calculators. So if you look at these risk calculators, in the top left uh, panel with the green circle, you can see these are all um, based on age. So under 50 at the top, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, and 70 years older. So if you're young and you've got a high blood pressure or high cholesterol, you're going to fall probably in the green zone. So it means that your risk over 10 years is, is quite low. But we probably don't really need to start any treatment. Whereas if you're over the age of 70 and you're a male, and let's say you're a smoker, which obviously no one in this room is, but automatically, even if you've got a slightly high blood pressure or cholesterol, then that needs to be treated. So we look at a variety of risk factors, whether you're diabetic, smoker, male, and age. And an easier way of doing this is on, online, and you can do this yourself. You can go to this website, JBS3. You can put in all your details. Um, it's even based on socioeconomic status, so kind of asks you what kind of house you live in. It kind of from that predicts kind of Obviously, if you're in a lower strata or higher strata, uh, 
like so other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, um, kidney disease. It wants to know what your cholesterol is and what your, your blood pressure is. And then it will generate a risk. So conventionally, we would say that over 10 years, if your risk score comes out as higher than 10%, like 1% per year, that's high, then you should start treatment. I should walk up and down more. <laughs> um, and it will give you something called your heart age. So ideally what you want is your heart age to be the same as your actual age or lower. Um, and that gives you some reassurance. It also tells you really how long you can go before you're likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. So it's based on obviously research and collecting thousands of patients of data based on statistics. So it's not 100% accurate by any means. But we use it to decide when we're going to start blood pressure tablets or cholesterol tablets. And the reason why probably this is getting a lot more attention in the media and whether everyone over the age of 50 should start taking a statin is because they've lowered the threshold at which we would start treatment. So a few years ago, we used to say if you're risk over 10 years was 20% or higher based on those formulas, that's when you should start treatment. So in these two patients, this patient on the left has got, let's say, uh, mildly elevated cholesterol 6, but normal blood pressure. We would say his 20%, his risk of having a 20% high, high risk of heart disease would mean he would start treatment in his mid-60s. And likewise, the patient on the right who's got normal cholesterol, but a high blood pressure, we would defer treatment to their mid-60s. But then the guidance came through, actually, we should lower the threshold to 10% risk. And that's lowered the bar so that now most people will go over that in their mid-50s if they've got either a high blood pressure or high cholesterol. So that's where the kind of information has come from to push us towards treating earlier. So you see a lot of scare mongering in the, in the newspapers, especially the Express, um, that statins can be a risk to health. Sometimes they say it's a wonder drug, and then, you know, they, they change. You'll see a lot of kind of groups on, on the internet saying that, you know, statins are basically poisonous. But the, a good website to go to is actually an NHS website, which um, it's called um, Behind the Headlines. And if you're concerned about something, you should go to that website to find out really what the true research says from the scientific community. And from our perspective, there's no doubt that statins do reduce heart disease, the risk of heart attack, prolong your life by up to 28%, because it does in almost everyone, it will reduce your LDL, your bad cholesterol, by up to 50% within a week or two of starting the drug. Now, if you, if you don't really want to take a statin, or you're quite young and you're kind of not quite reaching those thresholds that I've talked about, how can you modify your diet? So this is not just about cholesterol, this is about blood pressure. So the, the cornerstone is to have a high-fiber diet. Because fiber binds to the cholesterol in the gut and then you excrete it. So it doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream. So obviously fruit and vegetable packed full of fiber. So that's why there's a lot of recommendations having at least five portions of that a day. Whole grains. Whole grains means that it hasn't had the fiber stripped out of it. So not white rice, not white pasta. They've all been processed to have the fiber removed from it. So try and eat as much whole grain. That includes bread. Bread is not bad for you, as long as you have the whole grain variety. Um, nuts are very good for your heart health as well, olive oil. Um, so that's called basically the Mediterranean diet, and that generally works for most things. If you've got high blood pressure, there's a diet called the DASH diet. don't know if you've heard of that. Um, it stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Um, essentially, a lot of the salt that we have comes in the food already, not from what we add at the dinner table. So you have to, and mainly processed food, mainly packaged food will have a lot of salt in it. You want to 
replace the sodium in your diet with high potassium type of food. And again, that is vegetable, fruit, it's lean meat, um, legumes, which is peas and nuts and that kind of thing. Um, so that's the kind of, from the government and all the kind of scientific societies are now unequivocally promoting these kind of diets for reducing cholesterol, blood pressure, and generally your heart health. Obviously, this can mean that you're not left with much choice on the menu when you're coming to ordering at the restaurant, which is a problem. But um, now that vegetarianism and veganism in particular are becoming more mainstream, I think the choices are getting better. And in terms of cholesterol, what we want to focus on is just eliminating all these bad fats, mainly animal-based fats, anything that's been cooked in animal oil, desserts, ice creams, sorry, but yeah, they aren't good for you. Um, and we want to promote the good fats, avocado, salmon, walnuts, and, and olive oil. So that, that's the kind of trade-off. And I, I know many people understand that and, and realize it's logical. In terms of statins, um, if you can't control your cholesterol through diet, and as I said, it has to be almost eliminating all animal fat in your diet to get there, then sometimes have little option but to try statins. And they get a bad press, as we've been looking at before. Some people think that they cause a lot of symptoms, a lot of muscle ache. And that can help. That can happen to certain people, definitely. So they will get very painful, weak muscles that have become weak, especially in the, the large muscles, in their thighs, in their arms. And that affects actually a very small proportion of patients. Less than half a percent of patients will get that genuine, what we call myopathy, where the muscles get inflamed by the drug. And we do some blood tests usually to see if there's been release of muscle enzyme into the blood to confirm that that's the case. And sometimes we have little option but to withdraw it. But with the modern statins that we use at the moment, it's very rare to kind of see those side effects because they've been developed and the latest generation work very well. Undoubtedly, a lot of these symptoms are not attributed to statins or attributable to statins. So some people will find soreness in their joints, generally feeling a bit more tired, generally feeling a little bit more achy. So when they did a study, when they randomized patients to statins and a placebo, they had the same rate of side effects. So a lot of this seems to be something that people assume that they're going to develop just maybe because of the bad press of statins when it's not really due to the tablet. And there are some groups of patients where it's vitally important that they do take a statin. Anyone who's had a stent put in, had a heart attack, bypass surgery, then essentially they have to take a statin. In terms of other side effects from statins, other than the muscle problem, it can cause raise an uh, increase in the liver enzymes, but usually that's benign and we'll do serial blood tests and it doesn't often cause any serious lasting damage to the liver and we'll accept that and carry on. It can increase your blood sugars, so that causes a bit of a concern, obviously amongst diabetics, pre-diabetics, um, but it hasn't actually translated into those patients developing full-blown diabetes. So again, we think the benefit of the statin outweighs that issue. Um, and there is some kind of uh, concern that it may cause problems in the brain, dementia, confusion, but there hasn't been any kind of good quality data to confirm that. And you have to remember a lot of people that we use statins in may be predisposed to having those problems because of firing up of the arteries in the brain anyway. So in terms of reducing blood pressure, we've talked about... Um, how diet can be very important, and specifically, how do we go about doing that? So in terms of how much salt that you require in your diet, you should have no more than six grams, but that is salt. Salt is sodium chloride. Sodium is the problem, so we shouldn't have more than three grams of sodium. So when you read the packet, make sure that you're clear that it's telling you about the sodium content, not just the salt content. 
In terms of food that have the highest amount of salt, um, you can see actually anything that you buy in a packet will have high levels of salt. And bacon, um, even vegetable stock, anything, any sauces, chutneys and things like that will have a lot of salt in them. Baked beans, pizza, any processed meat will have a lot of salt. So that's a, the problem with processed food. Um, so crisps, peanuts are things that people tend to think of mostly, but sauces, ketchup, with a lot of salt in them. And don't be fooled if you're buying nice expensive food at Marks and Spencers that it's going to be good for you even though it's vegan option, etc. So on the left-hand side, this packet has got 1.28 grams of salt in it. I mean, that's okay. It's in the amber zone. It's 21% of your daily intake recommended amount. On the right-hand side, this cheese uh, plowman sandwich, you can't read that maybe. That's almost 1.9 grams of salt. That's over a third already of your recommended daily intake. So for my patients with high blood pressure who, before they start tablets, I pretty much say just don't eat, don't buy anything from Pret-a-Porter, pret um, pret pret Pret-a-Manger, <laughs> um, Marks and Spencers, um, even though you think that it's good for you. Um, if you make your own food fresh at home, that's going to be much better. And we've already discussed the DASH diet, so actually we can skip this slide. In terms of blood pressure medications, I'll briefly touch on this. Um, there's four main groups, and depends really um, the individual patient, which one we go for. There's some that are more effective in, in certain types of people based on your ethnicity as well. So we may, may use different uh, blood pressure medications there. Um, but classically, we use probably the calcium channel blockers, second from the bottom. Amlodipine is a very popular one. Um, the ACE inhibitors at the top ending in Pril, or the angiotensin antagonists ending in Sartan. We use a combination of those with amlodipine. In some patients, particularly patients who are overweight, we use diuretics, and that actually gets rid of the salt more effectively and lowers the blood pressure. So we may add in, in those medications. So my research um, was based on the lollipop study, which some of you may have actually been participants in, knowingly or unwittingly. Um, and that was a large study of about 30,000 healthy people who hadn't developed cardiovascular disease. And the reason why we were interested in is we know that Asians who have migrated to the UK still have 50% higher risk of developing heart disease and dying from heart disease compared to the native white population. And that applies to Asians who have migrated wherever they go to the world, whether it's Singapore, whether it's East Africa, they seem to then develop higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Next. So as I said, the risk in Asians is much higher than the native population, and it's 50% higher amongst Asians. So on the face of it, simple answer to the question is yes. But when you look at break down the individual risk factors, this is compared to your white people. Obviously, there's a trade-off of risk factors. So in our community, obviously, there's zero smoking. Blood pressure tends to be higher. Cholesterol is similar. But you can see the problem. We have a lot greater diabetes. We have a lot more fat that we're carrying around, particularly around our hips, and higher triglycerides and less good cholesterol. And my research, we looked at the arteries directly in the neck and in the heart. So we took scans, we did CT scans of the heart arteries, we did ultrasound scans of the neck arteries. So we did that in about... 1,000 Asians, 1,000 European whites. And there was no difference. So in terms of when you look at the artery, the health of the arteries is between us and a white person in terms of narrowing of the arteries or blockages. So there's something else going on. And we think it's related to the diabetes and the lack of activity and exercise 
when you compare what happens to someone when they migrate, let's say from Punjab, and this, this study did, on the left-hand side, you can see body mass index on average is about 22, so that's pretty good, less than 25 is, is normal. When they migrate to the UK, it shoots up to 27. Cholesterol shoots up. The percentage of people with diabetes shoots up to almost to 15%, as high as 20% in our study. Blood pressure goes up, and um, cholesterol is about the same. And there's a theory. There's a theory that there's something to do with our g genetics over many thousands of years that we've adopted a certain survivor gene, a thrifty gene that protects us against, protected us, our ancestors, many thousands of years ago against famine. But we've inherited that gene. So now when we are exposed to high calorie diets, we lay down a lot more fat. And that's what increased our risk of diabetes. But that's a theory. It hasn't really been proven. Um, and in India, there's the same problem. So people who migrate to the cities, but obviously now in the villages in Punjab, the diet is changing. Activity levels are reducing. So we're seeing a similar problem occurring in India uh, as we have done already in the West. Now, in terms of, you've heard of the Mediterranean diet, that may not be something that people are going to be able to incorporate into their cuisine in this room readily. But we have a, a good points to our traditional Indian diet as well, which traditionally has been very low in meat, um, high in vegetable, high in lentils and legumes, as I've discussed before, are, are very important, high in antioxidants, probiotics. We heard from our previous speaker the importance of the gut bacteria, and that's something that's a very exciting area now of all research, whether it's to do with the immune system, whether it's to do with the heart. And we're finding that this, that the gut is now being regarded as like a second liver. And if you uh, eat certain foods that encourage a diversity of bacteria in your gut, then you're likely to have less problems across the board. And obviously, I don't know if anyone really cooks with ghee anymore, but that seems to be a, maybe a bit of a myth. But it's something that should be avoided at all costs, and you should be using, obviously, plant-based oils to do your cooking. So this is um, my favorite slide, um, exercise. Um, and this was taken from the paper, actually, this slide, um, in which they did the research. Now, how much exercise should we be doing? And you probably all should have known, should, should have heard that the recommendations are that we should be doing around 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. So where did that come from? Next. Next. So they did this huge study, um, 130,000 people from different income backgrounds, high, middle, low income backgrounds. They divided it into kind of recreational activity, so that's running, swimming, and non-recreational. So that's the thing you just do on a daily basis. So if you're an active person at home, if you're doing a lot of housework and gardening, they even managed to measure, measure that. And they found that if you do a low level of exercise, that falls into that... Um, blue box there. So that's less, less than 600 METs a week. METs is like a measure of intensity. Then you're going to stay at quite a high risk of having heart attack or dying from heart attack. Whereas if you can do a moderate amount of exercise, that's between 600 and 3,000 METs per week, you can see that black line, how it drops quite steeply in that zone. If you do more than that, if you do a high level of intensity, more than 3,000 METs per week, you still get some benefit, but you can see it's starting to flatten off that curve now. So you're not going to get a lot more benefit from doing that level of exercise. Obviously, people do that because they love being that fit and competing. That's, that's fine. But for the average person, you don't need to go you know, running 20 miles every week. So what does it take to get into that moderate zone between 600 to 3,000? So in terms of the, the activities that you do at home, So these are, for example, sweeping, doing the hoover, gardening, 
that actually, if you do that 30 minutes a day and you do that five days a week, that just about gets you into that blue box. So that's not bad. But as you saw, the curve got a bit steeper as you got towards the edge of the box. So that's really what we're aiming for. Next. So if you do walking briskly, so that's probably enough to ha make you struggle to complete a sentence when you're talking. And if you do that for 30 minutes and you do that five days a week, then you get, in, get 750 mets. So you're getting much further into that blue box. But if you start running and you do that 45 minutes, five days a week, then you're going to go to the edge of that blue box. So that's kind of what you want to be aiming for is somewhere between the walking and, and the running, I think. But doing the walking for 30 minutes, five days a week, is the minimum that everyone should be trying to achieve. Actually, I'm going to skip the diet. Um, alcohol, something that is dear to many people's hearts. Is it bad for my heart? <laughs> well, the short answer is yes. If you drink more than 200 units, uh, 200 grams per week, then you start seeing your risk of mortality starts to, to climb up. But as you can see, between zero and let's say 150 grams on the right hand side, actually it's protective. So it's about drinking it in moderation. So 100 grams is about 12 and a half units. So you, the recommendation is about 12 and a half units per week. And it's generally very good for the arteries. So probably will reduce risk of heart attack. But as I was saying earlier on, alcohol directly can poison the heart muscle and cause heart failure and arrhythmia. So that's why you want to avoid drinking too much. Last slide now. In terms of emerging kind of things, th theories, and this is based on higher quality science, um, having an egg a day is probably not the right thing to do. That does increase your risk of having heart attacks. As I said, egg has got quite high levels of cholesterol in it. Now, you may see some story in the newspaper next week saying there's some other research showing that egg is good for you. But just be aware that a lot of these studies are being funded by vested interest groups and the egg industry is obviously very big and important and vocal. Um, Middle-aged men, whatever that means, um, if you can do 40 push-ups, then that's a very good sign. That means that you've got much lower risk of developing heart disease than someone who can only do 10 push-ups. And that's without training. Not eating meat is now been endorsed in terms of reducing heart disease, heart attacks, um, particularly red meat, which seems to work again on the gut bacteria and produce this very um, high kind of um, risk cholesterol that deposits into the arteries. Um, diet drinks with artificial sweeteners are also now being found to be bad for your cardiovascular system. Again, we think it's from how it works on your gut bacteria. Although it hasn't got any sugar in it, it's something that I think everyone should be drinking in a lot more moderation rather than I think there was a trend for just over-consuming it because it tasted nice. And high blood pressure, um, exercise is probably as effective as taking medicine. So a lot of patients, I'm actually now de-prescribing their blood pressure tablets and asking them to exercise, particularly if they're, they're not happy with taking the medicines anymore. So I think that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention.